How do we make 3D renders look real? Well, today we're gonna talk about it. What is going on Pro EDU community? It's Dustin Volkema, and today we're talking about a few concepts that can help you better achieve photorealistic results in your 3D renders. Now, regardless of the type of rendering that you're doing, whether it's product rendering or architectural visualization, or just some cool abstract art that you want to make look real, these concepts are really going to work across the board. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first tip or concept here is to have a good understanding of photography and photographic lighting techniques. Having a good understanding of cameras, lighting, shadows, how to manipulate the two of them is going to help you out a lot. And also having a good understanding of a depth of field, focal distance, the distance from your camera to your subject, Maybe lens effects, things that you usually spend time fixing in post like chromatic aberration, film grain, bloom and glare, and little bits of things that make your photo imperfect. Adding a lot of that in your 3D renders is going to be huge. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of these examples that I have here for you. All right, so here we are. I've got a render in Photoshop open um, that I did here quite recently. And what we want to look at here is simply just the difference that understanding some of these things that make our photos from our camera imperfect can help achieve a better, more photorealistic result in 3D once we start to add these. So in this case, I did quite a bit of this in post-production, a side of the depth of field. Regardless, let's go ahead and check it out. Now we have our beauty layer here at the bottom that has no depth of field. You can see that it looks quite cluttered. There's not really a focal point here in the image. And then as soon as we add depth of field, a lot of that starts to take shape and focusing on the subject here, which is just the primary sconce in the middle of our scene. Now, as we start to make our way into this other folder here, uh, what I did at this point is just went in and added a little bit of chromatic aberration. So I just did this through the lens corrections in Photoshop and it worked out really well just to add a little bit of detail. And these are the small hints of detail that are really going to set a photorealistic render apart from one that doesn't have these effects. Now, as we worked our way up, I went ahead and just used my post-processing. I was rendering in Cinema 40 and Octane, used my post-processing pass to add the bloom and glare here in post. And we can see the way that this adds a huge difference to the environment of these lights. Now, this is something that we would be quite used to seeing to some extent. Now, Personally, in my style, I, I like to push things a little bit further in post, but nonetheless, this is all stuff that we would be used to seeing in a real world environment. So things like bloom and glare, little hits of light, light dispersion, if you're talking about rendering on glass, things of that nature, it's always good to pay attention to those small details. Now, lastly here in this simple composite, I just added a little bit of grain. So we can go ahead and zoom in here. And we just added some grain to the darker areas in this scene. And what that does is allows us to look at this and immediately start to see those small details that we would normally see when shooting with a real physical camera. And so a lot of times adding these type of details and the, these imperfections are going to help you out quite a bit. All right, tip number two is to use good reference images. Now, references are a huge part of photorealistic rendering because it gives you a good base on what you're shooting for. So if I'm working on a client project, say I'm doing product rendering for them, I either like to have them send me a physical copy of the product that I'm rendering or have them shoot plenty of reference images so that I can see exactly how the materials differ from one another and what they really physically look like on that product so that as I'm rebuilding these materials, doing the lighting in 3D, I know exactly what to expect and it gives me a target to hit. So references are always good. My top places to go for that are Google, Pinterest, and then I like to use Pure Ref on the back end of that as I'm starting to actually work on the environment and building out my materials. If you guys don't know about Pure Ref, Pure Ref is an awesome desktop referencing application. 
and it allows you to drag multiple different references into a single window so that you can view them and you don't have to spend time on the web looking through Google and different images. It's very easy to get distracted, accidentally procrastinate, <laughs> spend hours looking at cat videos when you didn't expect to, and it's definitely a good place. So this is what I like to use as my reference uh, application. It's available in Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Not getting paid by these guys, but uh, pureref.com. This is the application that I like to use personally. All right, so the next tip is to use high quality 3D models. And it's pretty self-explanatory why. They're going to give you better realistic results when it comes time to adding textures, applying materials, and then working your way to lighting. So using models that are going to give you enough detail is definitely going to be a plus. Now, in the physical world, there's no such thing as a razor sharp 90 degree edge and it's really good to add a slight bevel to the edges or corners of your models on the 3D side. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example. All right, so here we are with a simple setup with uh, two cubes. Now we can see here on the right side that we have a perfect edge or corner to this. Now, though it may look cool, if you're wanting to get something a bit more photorealistic, this isn't really going to be the route to go. What we're going to want to do is add a slight bevel to all of these edges, and that's going to allow us to have a little bit better light fall off, some nice hits of reflection on these corners, something that's a little bit more physically accurate in the real world. And that's definitely going to be a plus on the 3D side. Now, if you're getting CAD from a client or if you're downloading CAD models, this is definitely going to be more of the range that they're in here on the right side. A lot of times they're not going to have these nice bevels built in. Now, as you start to manipulate those, you can definitely do this with something like a round edges shader that's available in most 3D render engines and it's going to give you a good result without having to manually add in the different bevels here. So let's go ahead and talk about textures and materials. Having the proper textures on your 3D models is going to be key because you want them to look as photorealistic as possible. So if you're using something like say a walnut wood grain, it's going to make sense to have a walnut wood grain texture that matches the reference in the photo that you're trying to recreate or using as reference. Now, the scale of your textures is also going to be key. If you're, say, very close up on a product that has a walnut wood grain to it, you're going to want probably a larger, more high resolution texture, something like 8K, possibly 4K, depending on how close you are. And the further back that you get, the more you can start to step down those texture sizes. That's only going to save your software resources when it comes time to render. Now, as you start to talk about the type of textures to use, I personally like to find PBR textures. I've got a video out that's talking about the resources and places that I like to go to find different assets. You guys can go ahead and check that out. I'll leave a card so that you guys can see this here in the video, but it's really good to have good quality textures and a place to start when you're starting to get into the texturing side. Now, if you happen to be using seamless textures or textures that are built to be able to repeat infinitely, you're going to want to make sure to be aware of the repeats that are visible in that texture as you start to scale that up and down on your model. And it's one of the dead giveaways of a CGI render is when you have a constant or repetitive pattern in those textures. And so just make sure to check for those. Um, having a good scale, a lot of websites are going to tell you the general scale of their seamless textures, and it's a good base to start from. Now, you can also fix this sometimes when it comes to post-production and just use the clone or heal tool to get rid of certain repetitive patterns, but it's definitely something you want to do if you're looking for a photorealistic result. So when it comes time to applying materials, a very good thing to take note of is surface imperfections. And a lot of times on the 3D side, I like to add these in the bump, the normal, and the roughness channels on my 3D materials, and that's going to give me a very good surface breakup. 
Now, in the physical world, it's very rare to find a perfectly clean surface that is void of any dust or any particulates that happen to be on that surface that you're creating in the 3D space. So adding surface imperfections is always going to be a good key to achieving photorealistic results. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. All right, so here we are again looking at our cubes. Now, the cube on the right side here is perfectly clean, uh, just has these nice beveled edges, and it looks really nice. Now, this is great for a lot of different types of product rendering where you want the surface to be perfectly clean and sleek, and you're not really looking for any type of grunge. Now, on the left side here, we have a very simple roughness map that's breaking up the surface reflections, as well as having that same map plugged into the bump channel, which is giving us the illusion that we have little nicks and dings all over this model. And you can see that it's appearing to break up these different edges. And this is one of those things that's really going to give you much more of a photo real result. Now, this may be quite the over-exaggerated example here, but if you were looking at something like maybe your phone screen, you can see that there are bits of dust and, and particles there that would be happening in the real world. And so it's a really good idea to add those. Now, while we're talking about materials, one of my favorite things to do, even if I'm using something like PBR textures that are going to give me a little bit more of a good starting point, is add a level of complexity to them. And that just has to do with building up various textures in my materials. Now we can see here, this is the Pro EDU Wind Machine Fan. You guys can find this on our website. I'll leave a link in the description to it. But this is going to give us a good example here of what adding imperfection and grunge detail to a model can really do. Now, I admit this is a little bit over exaggerated in this case, but it will get the point across. So currently we see that it's just a very clear, nice void of imperfection red paint. Now in my material creation process, I use the PBR textures that we include with the model here, but then I also added a few variations of my own as well as I was building the material. So adding things like these indents and the bump, the scratches, the reflection imperfections that we have happening here is really going to be key in achieving photorealistic results. So I never hesitate personally to add a little bit of wear and tear when needed. And as you're starting to create these various types of imperfections and breakup, it's a really good idea to make sure that you're adding plenty of asymmetry to your model or to your materials so that one side doesn't look like the other and they don't look like some perfect uncanny set of artifacts. So the last tip or concept that we're talking about today is post-production. Don't forget about post-production. It's something that we use on our photos and it's also something that we use just as much on our 3D renders. Now I use post-production for things like adding bloom and glare if I need it, if I didn't quite do it in the render, film grain, depth of field, color grading, these are all things that we can do on the post-production side that are only going to enhance our 3D renders. Now, it is very common. Almost every good 3D artist uses post-production. A lot of times we'll go through, if I'm doing client work, I'll go through and sometimes retouch my 3D renders just in the same way that I do when I'm doing photography. And that's because there are things that may make more sense to do in post than it does on the 3D side. So it's all about finding that balance. And it's all about finding a balance between the fake CG looking renders to the photorealistic looking renders and knowing exactly how far you need to push those one way or the other. So that's all for today, guys. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We'll have more of these type of videos on these tips and tricks and little bits of information that will be coming out. But until then, never stop learning. I'll see you guys in the next video.